Wixie 1260 Online is excited to be joining the 2019 Summit Racing Equipment IX Piston Powered Autorama for our fifth year and will be hosting some all-stars of our own. You'll be excited to know the all-stars who will be joining us at the Wixie 1260 Online booth as they move on up to the main hall of the IX Center near the Ferris wheel. Joining us on Saturday this year and providing autographs are Deanna Adams, author of the books Rock and Roll and the Cleveland Connection and Cleveland's Rock and Roll Roots. Fran and Jules Belkin of the legendary Cleveland Belkin Productions. Larry Morrow, beloved Cleveland disc jockey from the original Wixie 1260 AM. And Tony Prinios, one of the receptionists at Wixie 1260 AM. Come dance, sing along, or just relax at the vintage relaxation station with the Wixie 1260 online DJs and staff as we broadcast live from the show all three days. Grab some great Wixie gear or spin the Wixie Wonder Wheel for a cool prize. So join us March 15th, 16th, and 17th at the Piston-Powered Autorama at the Cleveland IX Center. If a piston makes it go, it's in the show. 1260 Wixie. There's Vitroy, hey, Mr. Vital. How's it going? The other How you doing, man? We How are, you doing? We are at Autorama 2019 yeah, at the Wixie 1260 Online booth and mobile studio. <laughs> And this year we have a relaxation station. Anyway, oh look out, here it comes! Yeah. 
records for 1967. Starting with number 100, Wixie will count down the biggest hits according to their popularity in Cleveland during the past year. A souvenir copy of the top 100 for 1967 is available in Monday's Cleveland Press. Now, Wixie 1260 proudly presents the top 100 countdown show for 1967. Let's move on with Bunny Singler. Good afternoon, everybody. The time, 12 noon. Let the good times roll. We are letting the good times roll at Wixie 1260 Online. Good afternoon. I'm Tony Z, and uh, I am sitting here in the Wixie Relaxation Station this afternoon at the 2019 IX Piston Powered Summit Racing Piston Powered Autorama. And uh, I have a gentleman here that was one of the original Wixie 1260 Supermen. He was voted number one DJ in Cleveland in a Cleveland press poll back in 1972. He's known as Mr. Cleveland, and he is definitely Cleveland radio royalty and a legend. Ladies and gentlemen, show some Wixie love, piston powered to the Duker, Larry Morrow. Duke, Thank you, Tony. Duker, welcome to Wixie 1260 Online. Boy, that, that's quite an intro. Well deserved. <laughs> well deserved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm as I was just sharing with you, our paths had crossed many years back, and I just showed you some photos that uh, I had taken when I was about 15 years old. You were in the studio well, and doing you your were, thing. You were 15 and I was 16. <laughs> so <laughs> nice to see those pictures again. Yeah, same here. <laughs> same you. here. And uh, to coin one of your phrases, I uh, certainly hope you're feeling jam up, jelly tight, and <laughs> peanut butter right. You know, in, Tony, in, in those days, it was, it was so much fun being on the air. And I would just sit down and write these weird kinds of things that were fun. It was not only uh, jam up, jelly tight, peanut butter right. I would come on the air and say, uh, it's a duker, Larry Morrow. Um, I'm here to get your heart to quibble and your liver to bibble. Ain't nothing cooking but the peas in the pot, and they wouldn't be cooking if the water wasn't hot. There you go. <laughs> Things like that well. was great times. Yeah. Remember well. Which you could never do today. You know, yep. that's how much radio has changed over the years. But it was great fun then. Yep. And uh, you've authored a book. Uh, this is Larry Morrow. Uh, yeah, against my best wishes. Uh, when the publishing company called me, I, I actually had called the publishing company um, on a book that I wanted to write on leadership. I was teaching leadership development at John Carroll University. And he said, Larry, nobody buys those books. Why don't you write a book about your career? And I basically said to him, I said, who cares a hoot of what I would have to say about anything? And he said, well, I would like to know what it's like to be on a, a big radio station like you were for all those years. What's it like to introduce the President of the United States? What's it like to be in front of 450,000 people? And on and on and on. And then I agreed to write three or four chapters of the book to see if, it, if, if he liked it or not. So I wrote three or four chapters, never believing that they would go ahead and, and ask me to write the book. So he said, OK, we're ready to go. So then I sat down and I wrote it. Wrote it. And I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing it. 
Well, I just uh, I, I bought the book back in the uh, fall and went through it for the second time in preparation oh. for, for today. But, uh, you know, have a few things I'd like to touch on with you. And, you bet. And then obviously get, uh, yeah. get your thoughts on, on some things that you want to talk about as well. But uh, I guess one of the first highlights was uh, when you were back in 1956 on your way to boot camp for U.S. Marines, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, you had a chance meeting in the Chicago airport. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, a story from a long time ago. Yeah, I was with a bunch of guys. We left Detroit, which was my hometown. We left Detroit and with a stopover in Chicago. Uh, and Elvis Presley had his first hit song out called Heartbreak Hotel. And you had just, every once in a while, you got a, a chance to see him on television. And so um, the plane had landed and we had a, an hour and a half before the next uh, tour out to San Diego, California to the Marine Corps Depot. And uh, we went into a, a, a bar just to get a Coca-Cola or something. And I said to the guys, I said, look who that is. And they said, what are you talking about? And I said, that's Elvis Presley sitting at the bar all by himself. Let's go up there and, and say hi and get an autograph. So we did. I said, Elvis, uh, congratulations you know, uh, uh, on your hit record. I've been a fan for as long as you've been out there, which not, had not been that long. And he, and he, for the most part, in his own way, said, thank you for your service. He didn't say that. That was not a popular term in those days. But so uh, I said, OK. He thanked us. And, and what did we know? A year later, he'd be in the Army. But I, uh, he signed an autograph for, to all of us on these little paper napkins. None of us, I'm sure, have that napkin. <laughs> I surely don't. And wouldn't that be nice to have? And, and I think in the book I called that my very first interview. <laughs> well, this is a pinnacle interview for me. Yeah. We got... Uh, well, since my baby left oh. himself. <laughs> I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down again. Tony Z, Wixie 1260 Online, a little reminiscent, uh, the first song, Heartbreak Hotel there by Elvis Presley. I'm sitting here in the relaxation station with the Duker, Larry Morrow, and we're talking radio and his career that spanned uh, the Cleveland Airwaves for 40 years. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, a little over 40 years. It was wonderful. Yeah. And uh, you came to Cleveland. You came to Wixie. You were originally, uh, or prior to that, you were at CKLW, the Big Eight. Tell, yeah. us, uh, tell us how that all kind of came well, about. Well, uh, when I went to CKLW, I, was, I, I had arrived actually probably too soon. You know, before you get into a major market like Detroit, which is the fifth largest radio market in America at that time, you really should have had 10 to 15 years experience. And all of a sudden, I'm there in two years. And as I, uh, I listened around to all the personalities, and I thought, I'm not good enough to even shine their shoes. And so I started on the all-night show at CKLW. And I had been there for a year. And then all of a sudden, I, uh, I went. The ratings were not good from 7 to midnight. And so I went to the uh, program director, and I said, I think that we're, pro we're programming the radio station from 7 to midnight the wrong way. We should be rocking and rolling. After all, this is Detroit. So he said, why don't you come on from midnight until 2 o'clock and show us what you think that show should be like. So I came on as the Duker. That was my nickname. You know, Duke Windsor the Duker, which is not my real name, by the way. <laughs> my real name is Larry Morrill. So, so, I, so he liked what he heard, and then I started on the, uh, on the 7 to Midnight show. And I remember getting letters from people from Cleveland like crazy, and the phone calls from people like crazy, because the signal came right across Lake Erie and then, uh, so I was, there for, I was there for two years, and uh, I was just voted, because it was a teenage poll, I was voted Detroit's most popular DJ. Again, I listen to Ron, and I can't shine the shoes of all the guys that are there, and that's a major market. So uh, in those days, when a radio station was sold, Tony, they fired all the DJs, and they brought in all, the, brought in all their own people, similar to what Wixie 1260 did. You know, they bought the radio station. All brand new guys were here. So, but anyway, uh, so I got fired. I was fired after being there for two and a half years. And it said in the Detroit Free Press, the big newspaper like the Plain Dealer, 
it said, um, Detroit's most popular DJ, fired. Oh, and I was devastated. So I get a call from Norm Wayne, you know, the owner of Wixie 1216. They'd only been on the air a few months. And he said, uh, I'd like to have you come to our new station called Wixie 1260. And I'm thinking, there is no way I'm coming to Cleveland, Ohio, because I'm on my way to, Detroit, to New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, but not Cleveland, Ohio. And at that time, Tony, Cleveland, Ohio was the eighth largest market in America. So uh, I came in for the interview, and he said, I want you to work from 7 to midnight. No, he said, I want you, yeah, it was, it, they had fired Jack Armstrong. So he said, I want you to do the 7 to midnight show. And he said, I don't think you realize that your, that your night show from CKLW was ranked number one in Cleveland as well. So that was wonderful. So, uh, so he hired me to go 7 to midnight, and I was pretty excited about coming. But at the same time, I had my eyes on a bigger pie. But I said, I'll stay in Cleveland for a few years, and then I'll go to these other markets. So then he calls me in about um, two weeks, and he said, um, I'm sorry that, that we've decided to keep Jack Armstrong. We have no room for you. And I said, that's OK. Because again, I, I thought, I, I'm going to a bigger market. Then he called me about a week later, and he said, would you consider coming back to Wixie 1260 and doing the midday show from 9 till noon? And I, I accepted. So now I come in for the interview, and he never asked me my real name. He kept on referring to me as the Duker. He said, oh, this is going to be great. Duke Windsor is coming to Cleveland, Ohio. And so I get hired. Jane Scott does an interview with me. And she said, do you know how excited that we are that that Duke Windsor is now coming to this new radio station, Wixie 1260. As a matter of fact, she wrote, and I, and I, and I brought it with me because I couldn't remember, it said, uh, when the Dukers set foot down in Cleveland, an iconic brand was born. That was Jane Scott's quote when I came here. And so she puts in the art, she said, by the way, is your real name Duke Windsor? I said, no. She said, what is it? And I said, it's Larry Moreau. And so she puts in the paper, uh, Wixie 1260 makes the Duke theirs, and below the picture on the Action Tab, the Plain Dealer Action Tab magazine, put my real name. So now Norm Wayne is out of town when I go on the air. And the program director, Johnny Canton, said, what are we going to call you? We hired Duke Windsor, but your real name is Larry, and now it's been in the paper. So he said, why don't you go on the air as Larry Morrow? And he said, and then um, when Norm Wayne comes back in, in a couple of weeks, we'll change it back to Duke Windsor. And I said, I don't know if that's going to work. So I go on, to go on the air as Larry Morrow. And as I write in the book, Norm Wayne is driving back, and he's listening to his Wixie 1260. And, he hears, and he's anxious to hear his Duke Windsor from 9 till noon. And he hears this guy called Larry Morrow and said, who the heck is that? I mean, that sounds like Duke Windsor, but who's Larry Morrow? And he comes in town. He walks in the studio. He didn't open the door, Tony. He pushed it open. And he looked at me, and he said, who the hell is Larry Morrow? He says, you've blown the whole thing. After, after the ratings came out about 18 months later, and now I'm number one, I wrote him a little note next to the ratings, and I said, dear Norm, you no longer have to ask, who the hell is Larry Morrow? <laughs> so and, that was... And you hold a record, as I understand, for a ratings period with a 70% share? 80. 80%. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. It was a one-time rating. Normally, it was around 50 to 55. Uh, but it was a one-time rating that we took over the... Um, I think it was over the weekend. The rating came out, had an 80 share. Of course, when the next rating book came out 13 weeks later, it was back down to a 55, and, um, and Norm Wayne wrote me a little note, and he said, Dear Duker, we will no longer put up with this kind of slippage. <laughs> That's funny. But you'd have uh, little, little bits, contests during your show, the what's cooking, and Larry, Larry, what's in the box, yeah. and... <laughs> think about that. Can you think... I, I'd go on the air and play... I'd say to the ladies, now, remember, women were home in those days. Yeah. They weren't working. And so I would say, OK, ladies, it's time for What's Cooking. Wonder, it was called Wonder What's Cooking. Wonder Bread sponsored it. 
So it was called Wonder What's Cooking, and I would come on and I'd say, okay, ladies, today we're gonna cook something uh, that you will make for dinner. And I would start giving out ingredients. Okay, the main ingredient today is two, uh, two little pieces of, of, of peanut butter. So then uh, they would start calling in. You know, I would say, uh, Wixie, what's cooking? Uh, Larry, is it a loaf of bread? No. And I would take 15 phone calls, and then I'd play a record, and then come back until they actually got it. But think about that. <laughs> yep. Very engaging. Giving recipes out on the air, and people actually loved it. Back in 65, you started playing a song because of your audience across the pond here in Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland's owned outsiders, Sonny Geraci. Yeah. Time won't let me. Yes, when I was at CK, I fell in love with that song. And, and I would say, for you Clevelanders, I said, I'm going to play a song, you know, Sonny Geraci, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, um, and it turned out to be the number one song in the country, I believe. So when I finally claimed to keep, came to Cleveland, I get a call one day, and he said, hey, Duker, I'd like to have lunch with you. And I said, OK, who are you? And he said, Sonny Geraci. <laughs> And then we, then we became pals. And the guy who wrote the charts for that song, Tom Baker, became a partner of mine, and we started a jingle company together called Cleveland Jingle Company, and we talked about that forever. And then became really close with Sonny until the day he died. Yeah, we lost him here a couple, couple years ago. Yep. But uh, yeah, the number nine song on the Wixie Super Top 100. 1966, Outsiders, Sonny Geraci, Wixie 1260 Online. Tony Z with you. We're here with the Duker Larry Morrow. Coming back right after this. Tony Z, Wixie 1260 Online with the Duker Larry Morrow from the original Wixie 1260 AM in Cleveland, one of the original Wixie Supermen. And you were just telling me you, you met a man that... There's a gentleman here from, well, who saw this interview, saw this interview, and he looked at me during the interview and he pointed to me like, I know you from Vietnam. And during the song, I went over and I said hi to him and I said, how do I know you? And he said, you interviewed me in Da Nang, wow. Vietnam, uh, in 1969. I, I was and he has the interview. I don't have those. Wow. And he said, Larry, I have the interview. He said, I've put it in a box. And he said, it was on reel to reel. And he said, you played it over the air for Thanksgiving and Christmas. You sent my mom and dad a cassette. Yeah. He said, which I still have. Well, I was going to wait till a little later. <laughs> but as long as we're talking about it now, Wixie 1260 brings the boys home for Thanksgiving, 1969. And I read it in your book. I got chills. I, I could feel your emotion. T tell us about that. What, the, what was it like making that trip in... in just your experience. Well, they're part of, and I, I believe I told that story in the book, but I'm not sure, Tony. Uh, I remember our program director, his name was Bill Sherrard, and, the, and Linda Scott was our promotion director. Uh, and I, I had only been at Wixie now, this is my third year, 1969, but Wixie 1260 is really popular with the kids. And so Bill Sherrard says, Linda has come up with a great idea. We've checked and we found out that we have a little over 200 men in Vietnam who obviously are from Cleveland. We'd like to have you go over there and inter interview them. Would you like to do it? And I thought, well, you're not going to get permission to go over there. They said, well, because you were a Marine, maybe we could get permission for you to go. So we tried everywhere. We tried with our congressman, we tried with the mayor, we tried with the governor, everyone who had any authority at all to help us to get there. And it turned out to be, Tony, unachievable. There was no way we could get permission to go. So one day, I get a call from the Pentagon, from a Colonel Melton. He said, is this Lawrence Morrow? And I said, I don't know who you are, but I, no one has called me Lawrence since the day I was born. And, and so uh, he said, this is Colonel Melton. And I said, how do I know that you are who you are? He said, um, he said do you remember your, your service ID number? And I said, of course. He said, is it 1622008? And I said, yes. 
And he said, the only other person that would have that number would be the military, the government. And now, so then I knew who he was. And he said, You've, your request to go to Vietnam has ended up on my desk at the Pentagon. President Nixon wants an end of the war. And what we would like to find out is how, how the men and women, both enlisted and um, officers, feel about the war. So we're going to send you over to Vietnam with a writer from Life magazine and a film crew from WFIL in Philadelphia. You'll interview all the Clevelanders. We'll tell you exactly where they are. But at the same time, everyone that you run into, you have to ask them how they feel about the war. Make that confidential report back to me. And nobody's to know about that report until you get back from Vietnam. I said, fine. So now I get my papers in the mail, Tony. And they are addressed to Major Lawrence D. Morrow. I get out of the Marine Corps as a corporal. <laughs> you know, I went private, you know, pri private first class and then corporal. And so I called the Pentagon back and I said, you've made a terrible mistake. I got out of the Marine Corps as a corporal. You addressed it to Major. They said, Colonel Melton will explain it to you when you get to Saigon. So now I get to Saigon. I go to see him immediately. And he said, the reason we're going to give you the rank of major is so you can go anywhere in Vietnam you want to go as an officer. And he said, uh, would you like to have a gun? I've noticed that you were an expert with a 45. And I said, I was. He said, would you like to have a weapon with you? And I said, of course. And I said, why would you even ask that question? He said, well, if you're an officer and you get, uh, and you get caught, he said, the chances are they won't kill you. They'll negotiate to get their people back for you. And so um, he said, and my guess is that you shouldn't carry a weapon. You can if you want. So I said, no, I, I, I will not have a weapon. So I went all over Vietnam, exactly where I needed to go to interview the Clevelanders without a weapon, but as a major. And it was so cool, Tony, having captains and and first and second lieutenants salute me. <laughs> I thought, is this, this is really great. And I went over there in my Marine Corps uniform as well. And obviously, uh, uh, because of the height of the war at that time and yeah. coming back, and w when Wixie made those tapes available to the parents of the, the guys that were overseas and uh, playing the tapes on, on the air, Obviously a life-changing moment for you. I, I know you're oh. very passionate about it uh, being ex-military, but certainly mm -hmm. a, a highlight for your career, a highlight for the station. Um, kudos. Well, you know, Tony, I made an agreement with everyone that I interviewed. I said, number one, when you get back from Vietnam, please call me because I want to take you to lunch. Uh, and secondly, uh, let's become friends. And what was interesting when I was there was whenever I would see anybody, they would recognize me immediately from all from Wixie 1260. And I would go up and I would say, hi, Tony, it's, it's the Duker. Oh, Larry Marl, the Duker from the world is here. And, and when you're in the military, anything outside of where you are is called the world. And one of the stories that I remember, there were so many, but I will only tell you one. I was just getting ready to leave Vietnam. I had come, gone down through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and, uh, and I ended up in Cam Ranh Bay Hospital. Uh, and so I thought, uh, I had not interviewed any of our people in the hospital yet. So I had a tape recorder on my left shoulder and a tape recorder over my right shoulder. And I walked through, just like you see in MASH, the green doors with a red cross. I walked through. And I took three or four steps, and I, and I didn't realize where I was at the time. And I was so upset by what I saw, I walked back. I had to compose myself. And off to the right-hand side of the doors, which I had not recognized, was amputee section. So now I, I compose myself. I walk back through the green doors with the red cross. And off to the left-hand uh, bed was a Clevelander. There were three Clevelanders in there who had had parts of their body amputated. And it was interesting. They would say, Larry, look, I'll do the interview, but you can't tell that I've lost a limb. Because when I get back to the States, I want to be able to show my mom and dad my new arm or my new leg. 
and it just it broke my heart but how brave these young men were and and i remember that's what i remember most about my trip to vietnam and then i didn't realize the impact that it would have on cleveland um, of all the interviews that i did we sent a cassette of that interview to every single parent and i still have some of those letters from the parents saying thank you for, for talking to my son or daughter and making sure that I got a copy of that interview. Fantastic. It was, and we played them not only for Thanksgiving, we also replayed them for Thanksgiving, I mean for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Great, they were, that was perfect. And out of that, from what I at least read in your book, the moms and dads that got those tapes became Wixie listeners. Yes, they did. <laughs> now we have adults listening. There you go. See, it was, it, it was really based on two thoughts. One of them was, um, what a wonderful thing this will do for our, for, for, our, for our radio station. But they were looking at getting adults to listen. And I remember the guy who did the interview with me, Bill Hickey. He was a radio TV writer for The Plain Dealer. I believe in the article he said, Wixie 1260 has now finally come of age. Because before that, we did promotions that I wasn't proud of, you know, the mini skirt contest, the big bus contest and stuff like that. So this was a promotion that catapulted not only the radio station, but it cemented my relationship with Clevelanders forever, even to this day. I think we have somebody standing by in the wings here that uh, may, uh, well, I know she knows you. I don't know if you're gonna remember her though. And it was somebody that uh, actually worked at the station. Oh, I know Tony. you. Tony. Oh. Tony, the receptionist. Tony, the receptionist at Wixie. Hi, Tony. You know, I've been looking at you a few times, and I thought, why do I know her? Tony, it's great to see you. I used to give you the What's Cooking contest. Did you hear that? I did. She would give me the, the, the What's Cooking. Oh, thank you, Tony. Good to see you. Good to see you. Sir. All right, thanks. Tony How Prinius. about that? <laughs> She the was receptionist, the receptionist at, Wixie. at Wixie 1260 Who put all the recipes together for, the, for what's cooking. Small world. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. How, how was it at Wixie as far as, uh, you know, the, uh, the other DJs? I mean, at, the, at your time, we had Mike Ranieri. You followed Mike. You had Chuck Dunaway, Billy Bass, uh, the Wild Child. I mean, any stories? I have stories about every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I? I can't even tell some of them. I'm uh, sure. <laughs> but I will, when I first got here, again, I had come from a major market, the fifth in America. So I'm really coming down, I'm stepping down, not up. And so when I got here, I started to listen to voices of, of some people that were very popular, like Bill Randall and Phil McLean. And I thought, these guys were nationally recognized. They didn't work at Wixie, but they had been there, they had been where I would love to go. And my first thought is, could I ever become one of them? And so here, Jane Scott makes me an icon, <laughs> and yet I'm, I'm listening around and I'm thinking, these guys are so good. Will I ever be able to attain in this marketplace what they were? And then I started to work with, of course, Mike Ranieri. And I got a couple great stories with Mike. Mike I came out at 10 o'clock in the morning and Mike worked until 10. So we always did a crossover, like about five to 10. And Mike was, Mike was funny. And I remember him getting a call one day. I'm listening to the radio and it's about 10 to 10. And there's a woman on the air and she says, when will the Duker come on? And now when will the Duker be here? And Mike said, well, his nose has arrived already. The rest of his body will be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> so that was Mike. And another day, it was the first day of spring. And, uh, and when I arrived, I, I would always dress up, by the way. You've got the picture of me in a tie. Yeah. So I always wore a shirt and tie to work. So this day of spring, I wore green pants, green shoes. It doesn't sound very attractive, but it was cool. It was really cool. Green shoes, green uh, socks, green pants a white seersucker green and white jacket with a green shirt and a green and white tie. And now I'm sitting in front of Mike Ranieri. And he said, um, what do you have on? And I explained to him. 
and he said, you look like the president of a lizard factory. <laughs> so um, that would, and there were many more, but I, I won't go into them, but it was funny. Mike was funny and I loved him. And it was, it was a wonderful welcome into my 10 to three show. Well, and, then, and then of course I worked with uh, guys like Lou King Kirby. Lou had a Cadillac and he had a fake phone in the Cadillac. And in the, it, was a, it was a big long stream Cadillac and we would ride with him to some of our promotions. And it had on the side of it a king and then there was a fake phone and when we would pull up to a light, uh, we would hope that the light would be red and then we would have a, the phone ring, go brrrr, and then he would pull the phone up and say, this is for you, Tony. <laughs> and it, so he was, he was funny as well. And then the wild child. I remember one day Norm Wayne, the owner, said, Larry, there's some funny things going on at the radio station. Would you go down and check it? And I only, I lived in Parma at the time, and the station was in Seven Hills, which for me was only five to seven minutes away. So I walk in the radio station about eight o'clock. He's on from seven to midnight. And uh, <laughs> I walked in the studio. I walked back out and I gave Norm a call and I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, but the wild child is sitting here doing a show and he doesn't have a stitch of clothing on. The only thing he has on is his headphones. He is doing the show totally nude. <laughs> that was the wild child. Unbelievable. I used to answer the request line for the uh, Wild Child. Oh, did you? When I was, because we would get credit for studio time for the Wixie School, and so I would, I would answer the request line for his show, and it, uh, yeah, quite a, quite a spectacle. Well, you know, you mentioned earlier, Jam Up Jelly Tight Peanut Butter, right? I wrote a song for him. It was called The Wild Child Freakout. And, uh, and in it was, I'm, I'm the wild child, I'm Jam Up Jelly Tight Peanut Butter, right? We sold 10,000 copies and I gave all the money to charity. We went to the plane dealer. The plane dealer put it right on the front page and said, if you want a copy of the Wild Child Freakout, Wixie 1260, uh, you can buy it here and we give the money to charity. So we sold 10,000 copies overnight. I think we actually have that song in our music library. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That's fun. We're going we're gonna to take a little break here, get back to some music just uh, real quick, and then we'll come back and kind of wrap things up. But this next song is actually a song that you got credited for playing. Breaking? Breaking. And it was The Who. Oh, I yes. Explain. I can't explain. Yeah. Well, we'll explain after this. Wixie 1260 Online, Tony Z with the Duker, Larry Morrow. Wixie 1260 Online, Tony Z here at the 2019 Summit Racing Equipment IX Piston Powered Autorama in the uh, Wixie Relaxation Station. And we are here with the Duker, Larry Morrow. So, so happy to have you here this afternoon. Great to be here. Thank you, Tony. And listening to those two songs, um, do you have a minute to listen to the story about I Can't Explain? Go for it. I'm, at, I'm working at, at a station in Flint, Michigan, the station before I went to CKLW. It was called WTRX, Trix 13. And a buddy of mine, Pete Gideon, had, had just discovered a group. Well, first of all, he was a promotion director for Decca Records. And they had just signed a brand new group called The Who. And he had brought the song to America. And he said, Larry, I'm promoting this song. And we wanted to start promoting the song in Detroit. And he said, but nobody in Detroit will play it. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's called I Can't Explain. So I, I played it. It turned out to be the number one song in the country. And when The Who came to Cleveland, and I was asked to introduce them, Wixie 1260 and, of course, Belkin. Who were here earlier. Yeah, they, um, you know, they, br they brought The Who here. And I introduced them, but we'd be, before, uh, before they played that evening, we went to Otto's Grotto in downtown Cleveland, and I had dinner with The Who. And they gave me a gold record thanking me for breaking the song. Awesome. As the number, as the first person in America to play it. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So that was, and then of course with, with The Wild Child, we were just thinking of, of, of um, he was so wild and he had all these sayings. I live in the woods, I know all the trees by the first name. So that's when I sat down and wrote, uh, get it on and, and put my jam up jelly tight peanut butter right in there. So, and, and again, it turned out to sell a lot of copies and 
All the money went to charity. Very good. Great. Very good. So you uh, earlier you were saying you wanted to share some thoughts about radio in general or retrospect as far yeah, as the, then now uh, I don't know what what what, what well, did you the, want to share when I when I came to Cleveland I never thought of myself and I spent my entire life Tony never thinking of myself as being a great DJ I just did not and it, I, I don't think it, because of the way that I was raised vanity vanity was never approved in, in my home in Michigan and so it stayed with me all those years and when when I was voted Detroit um, Detroit's most popular DJ that it happened again in Cleveland I didn't believe it and then when um, Mirror Magazine Mirror Magazine which was the, the the precursor to People Magazine picked the top 12 DJs in America and they called me one day and said we're going to pick the top 12 DJs in America and um, you're going to be the January issue. We're going to have one per month. That is when I was launched nationally and it made me feel like maybe I have arrived. You know, not only in Cleveland, but maybe I had arrived nationally and, and, it, and I felt now I have earned my stripes. And, it, and it, took, it took many, it took probably 25 years for me to start believing that I could be part of this whole group of guys that were respected nationally. Yeah. Well, you, you, you done right. You done good. <laughs> I mean, a guy from Pontiac, Michigan, coming to Cleveland, making Cleveland your, your home and yeah. a great ambassador over the years, not only on the air and off the air, the things that you did behind the scenes with uh, George Voinovich and back in, the, back in the day when Cleveland was basically a national joke. Um, you know, you, you, you were influential in turning things around and, and, you know, coming from a guy that grew up, born and raised Cleveland, thank you. Thank you for all you've done. You know, Tony, I arrived in Cleveland the day of the Huff Riots. Yep. And that is when I decided that New York, Chicago, L.A. were no longer part of my dream. That I wanted to stay in Cleveland, Ohio and do the best that I could and help turn the city around. I had a sign on my door that said, Cleveland, Ohio is the greatest city in America to live, work, play, and raise a family. And I joined the, t the Voinovich team. And when we turned the city around, I was just, that's when he gave me the title, Mr. Cleveland. And he said, Larry, there have only been two people in the history of Cleveland that have ever had the title of Mr. Cleveland. You are now number three. And I, and I wear that moniker proudly because I love this town a great deal. Very good. Very good. So what's on your playlist? What, what do you listen to these days, music-wise? Just, cur uh, just curious. Well, I write. I still write. Uh, I, had, um, I have been writing jingles for a long time. I, had, I was blessed to write Smuckers and some other national jingles. Uh, and then uh, I was sitting home, this goes back to 19, no, 2005. And being in the Marine Corps, um, I wanted to write a song that I thought was saluted our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. So I sat down and I, and I wrote this song. Uh, and I liked it. And I went to my dear close friend Avery, I said, Avery, I would like to get this song launched nationally. So we ended up with a contact in New York uh, who was uh, very close to Shania Twain. So I, I went to New York with Avery and uh, sh the manager uh, of Shania Twain said, we love the song, we want to record it. And it's called You're the Gift of America, saluting our veterans. And so the war got so bad over the next couple of months, we both decided that that Iraq is becoming another Vietnam. Let's not release the song. So then uh, I held on to it until about a year ago. And then I thought, you know what? I have a better idea. Now that, now that the world has changed, music has changed, and now that we have the internet and we have these things we call phones <laughs> that we take with us, maybe I could get this song uh, out in the open in a different way. So this was my dream, Tony, is to have a million people in front of the Lincoln Memorial 
uh, singing to a million veterans that you're the gift of America. And they would, those million people would have a picture of the love, their loved one who had served in the military singing this song to all the veterans. And that's in the process right now, and it looks like it's going to happen. So isn't that a, isn't that a great story? So uh, there, um, it, it has been a dream of mine to do that. And if God allows it to happen, um, we'll see what happens. So that's, the, the music that I listen to today is, believe it or not, the same music that I used to play. <laughs> uh, right at home. I'm still, you know, uh, I can't get no satisfaction. Jumpin' Jack Flash, uh, Aretha Franklin, all the Motown stuff. Uh, I had, a, as you know, a wonderful relationship with Barry Gordy. When we were at CKLW, Barry Gordy was just starting a new label called Motown. And so he would invite all the DJs to come over to Motown to meet some of the new artists. And so one day I'm over there, and Barry said, hey, Duker, I'll be right with you. Why don't you go in there? We're getting ready to sign this new girl. She's over there throwing darts, so why don't you go over and say hi to her? So I go over and introduce myself. I'm Duke Windsor. I work at CKLW. She said, I'm Diana Ross. She said, I'm hoping that Barry might sign me. She was 16 years old at the time. <laughs> and there, and there, there are so many stories like that, Tony. Can't tell them all. Well, we're here at the 2019 Piston Powered Autorama. Are, are you a car guy? Do you, I mean, coming oh, from the Detroit yeah, area? I had, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I had a 1958 Corvette. A Corvette. Which I'm looking for. I'm going to go around here looking for it before I go home. Okay. Because I, I, for some reason, I had a note. I thought you had a, a T-Bird. Did you own a T-Bird at one time? No. No? Okay. It was always, no, it was a 1958 Corvette. Corvette. Okay. Yeah. All right. GM yeah. guy. The mark of excellence. Yes. But, yeah. oh, but, you know that story? Uh, well. Do we I, have time to tell it? Tell it. Um, I'm 14 years old, and my mother, uh, who was a singer, she, you know, she said, honey, I always hear you hum songs and that, that I've never heard before. She said, maybe you're going to be a writer. So there was an ad in the um, Detroit Free Press and the Pontiac newspaper they were, they, they, they were looking for a writer for a jingle company in Detroit. So my mother said, why don't you hop on the bus, drive down, I mean, go down there, and tell them you're a writer. I said, well, Mom, I haven't written anything. She said, well, just tell them you're a writer and see what happens. So I get on the bus. Are you ready for this? The bus got, was a nickel. <laughs> Boy, am I an old dude now. The buses were a nickel. So I hop on the bus. I go to Detroit, I get off right where the jingle company was, I walk in, and the, uh, the secretary said, what can I help you with, son? And I said, well, my, I, here's the ad that was in the paper. And my mother said, I'm a writer. She said, well, what have you written? I said, nothing. So they felt sorry for me, so the owner of the company came down and said, um, tell me about what you've written. I said, I don't write anything. I told him the story about my mother. He said, well, look, we write jingles. And he said, do you know what a jingle is? And I said, no. And he said, it's a, it's a, a little 10-second song or a 5-second song or a 1-minute song or a 30-second song. And he said, I'm going to give you five little uh, logos. And he said, and what I'd like to have you do is I'm going to turn on the tape recorder and I'll walk out of the room. And then why don't you just hum a, a melody to each one of these phrases? I said, OK. One of them happened to be GM Mark of Excellence. So I write GM Mark of Excellence. He gives me a check. Now, again, the bus was five cents. He gives me a check for $15. And he said, I think we may use this. I'm not sure, but just in case we do, here. I am thrilled. 15 bucks was three months pay or whatever. So, so I get on a bus and I go home and I tell my mother, I said, they paid me for this. About three or four months later, we're listening on radio, and we hear GM, Mark of Excellence. So that was the first jingle I wrote, and they must have used it for 25 years. Wow. And then out of that came Smuckers and other jingles. So that was, yeah, that, that was one of the joys of my life. Well, we're going to wrap things up here. We're going to let you get 
back into the booth and maybe meet and greet with some, uh, some of the other folks here. Tony Z, Wixie 1260 online. The Duker, Larry Morrow, let's give it up for so well, some Wixie love. Let me, let me end the interview the way that I would end my show every day. I was gonna ask you to do okay. that. Please. I, I would end my show every day by saying, I'm the Duker Larry Morrow, do all the good you can to everyone you can, every time you can. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. And now, another classic Wixie soundbite. It's the Duker Larry Morrow on Wixie. In the high school spirit contest, Rocky River is almost right on top of St. Joe's, although I, say, I think the St. Joe's is holding out. St. Joe's in first place. We're not rich, so we do. Tony, you're awesome. at Wixie. What's cooking? 75 bucks for the groceries today from Fisher's. By the way, well, you'll son of a gun, you. Peggy Miller is our Wixie 50 for today. Peggy, listen, here's Poco for you, honey, plus some candy. I don't 